Good evening, everyone. We're going to call to order the September 26th meeting of the Capitola City Council. Can I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Clark? Here. Councilmember Morgan? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. Vice Mayor Brooks? Here. And Mayor Brown? Here. Please uh, join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda today? Stop. We'll just the agenda. Okay. We'll move on now to presentations, and we have a presentation recognizing the 2024 Junior Guard participants. Yep. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, as what is a very exciting annual tradition, after the summer, um, we'd like to come and present some of our top award, um, Junior Guard Award recipients. And so I am going to turn the main presentation over to Brennan Howard, who's going to talk a little bit about what these mean and then introduce the recipients. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, I'm here today to recognize the work that we put in through this entire last three months, not just towards our youth development or our general junior guards, but some uh, outstanding people that have really shone through throughout this entire season. Um, as a reminder, um, some of our core principles for junior guards is community outreach, personal development, physical training, competition and skills training, as, as well um, as emergency preparation. With all these things, um, we're, develop, we're able to develop this youth into really high-functioning members of society, whether that's in the form of helping out their neighbors or people that they see in the water, or just being able to assist people on a daily basis and wanting to do that. Um, with that, it takes <laughs> a lot of vigor and uh, high aptitude of skill to be able to consistently be putting in your best effort. Um, with a lot of the recipients that we have today, more often than not, they're doing water polo, swim lessons, or practice, or really putting efforts in all fronts. So for them to dedicate time outside of that and really be putting in 110% to us, uh, it shows a lot. Um, with that, we have some general things. Unfortunately, I don't have any slides up here today. So, um, but we have a lot of awards that we give out one of them being best support, which is someone that, you know, is always supporting, always smiling, someone that can have a grueling workout or deal with a hard day and continually be smiling throughout the entire process and supporting their friends around them. We have a team captain, which also similarly is able to rally their troops, right? Is able to be there and be that support. We like to say that if their instructors were gone, junior guards would still be happening. Um, there's a best all around who also is just an athlete, well-rounded, consistently putting in that 110% and pushing them, themselves and others around them. So those are like our general division awards. Those get given out to six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, Cs, Bs, As, and double As. Beyond that, there's beach-wide awards. Those are our Iron Men and our Iron Women, our Dory Award, and our Junior Life Card of the Year. So for our Iron Man and Iron Woman, those are people who show prowess and an ability to continually push their physical abilities. So this year we had a huge, um, we had a lot of JGs at regionals this year down in Southern California. And the consistency between us and our neighbors at Santa Cruz we're not only just podium spots, but also staying and supporting until everyone's finished. I think that's really important to note, as well as at nationals. Um, we had some participants who went out on their own, and that consistency, that consistency showed of what we're teaching in integrity was really apparent across the entire state of that capital in Santa Cruz, where these people that were the first to show up and always the last to leave. Um, for... The Dory Award, it's someone, something similar. 
it's a little less physical and more of showing up and no matter what's on your plate is that you're here and you're here to give it everything, right? It's a self-sacrifice. It's seeing your friend who might need a win and letting them pass you, right? It's picking up someone that might have fallen over and taking that loss to be able to support them and just consistently showing up, volunteering, and wanting to be in that helping hand. For our junior guard of the year, it's someone that encompasses junior guards, right? It's someone that has devoted their time for all those things and is more often than not helping out both sessions day in and day out and living and breathing the program. Um, so with that, um, I believe today we have a couple of people. So we have um, Waverly Brooks is here today. Um, Martin Cruz, possibly Cole Davila, and Sydney Wallace. And am I missing anyone else? Oh, and Kira Burke. Kira Buck Burke also this year. She wasn't able to make regionals, but she showed up to nationals and made a statement, to say the least. Um, so at this time, I'd like to invite them up to receive a proclamation of the mayor and congratulate them, not only at their awards, but just encompassing the program and everything that we love so dearly. Yes, congratulations. So thank you very much for the presentation. I just want to make note for the council that um, it is very common that the junior guard youth that end up receiving these awards are the individuals that become city employees and are on our beach. So we look forward to seeing how their futures develop within the city. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. We are moving right along to item four, additional materials. Staff received additional materials for tonight's agenda relating to items 7D, 8A, and 8B. All additional materials were made available to the public before tonight's meeting and are available for review uh, in a hard copy of our agenda packet in the back of the room. All right, thank you. We'll go now to oral communications by members of the public. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the council on any item not on tonight's agenda or any item on tonight's consent agenda. If you'd, if you'd like to speak, uh, go ahead and come up to the podium and uh, note your name if you'd like it included in the minutes. Um, hi, I'm Dave Montgomery, and I'm just speaking out in support of your agenda item 8A tonight, the uh, dog oh, I'm sorry, sir, the, this is for... Uh, this is the time to comment on items that are not on tonight's agenda. Oh. So once we get to item 8A, uh, you will be able to give comment then. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Goran Klopic. I play almost every day at uh, J Street Park basketball. I want to draw uh, attention to something that is sometimes happening at uh, J Street Park. That's illegal uh, marijuana smoking or even uh, alcohol consumption there where children play, like toddlers and uh, kindergarten uh, kids. Uh, I, I think it's also dangerous what uh, the procedures are at the moment uh, nationally that they want to uh, legalize marijuana on a certain ba uh, basis or, or level. I think it's a mistake. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Marilyn Garrett. Vaccines are unavoidably unsafe. That's a statement from the Supreme Court in 1986 when they decided to award money for vaccine injuries. Uh, to limited people who could prove it. And here's something else on vaccines. This is from uh, globalresearch.ca by Professor Michelle Tosudowski. There was never, quote, a new coronavirus, unquote. There was never a pandemic. Today, our thoughts are with the people of Japan, with the children of Japan. In the words of the former Minister of Internal Affairs, Kazuhiro Haraguchi's courageous statement, quote, you were right, vaccines are killing millions of our loved ones, unquote. There's uh, Japanese writing under here, quote, they are trying to block our freedom, our resistance, our power, but we will never lose, unquote. Of significance, the fraudulent narrative concerning the COVID vaccine is collapsing in different parts of the world, with Japan in the lead. We call on the immediate cancellation and worldwide withdrawal of the COVID vaccine. Japanese researchers say side effects of COVID vaccines linked to 201 types of illnesses by Lee Harding. This is from January of this year. Japanese researchers say their shocking systemic review of research papers on COVID-19 vaccine has discovered thousands of side effects, quote, affecting every possible aspect of human pathology, unquote. The findings were laid out in the 93-minute press conference. See video below with English subtitles in Japan, held January 11th by the Vaccine Issues Study Group, a panel of esteemed medical experts. The findings followed six months of investigations into the side effects of COVID-19 vaccines. Professor Emeritus Masunori Fukushima of Kyoto University, long a fierce credit of the critic of the vaccine, said the breached breadth of the harms is unprecedented for medical treatments. Let's see. Anyway, it's a video of the press conference taken down. Lots of censorship on this. I'll leave you with this. Big problems with side effects. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi, my name is Terry Allsberg. I live in Sunset. Uh, I just want to ask, whose idea was it to do what you did at the Hill Street inter intersection? It, it, who voted for it? Did, did all you people vote for it? So this is a time for you to speak to the council, and then once your comments are done, we can either address uh, questions that have been asked or ask staff to address questions that have been asked, but we don't do back and forth during public comment. Okay. Well, my question is, who thought that was a good idea? And uh, maybe when I leave, you can explain to me why you thought that was a good idea, because it's created a nonstop traffic jam right outside the street that I come out of, and I never see, we had a bicycle path there before, and bicycles seem to navigate just fine. I ride a bike. I had no problem navigating that. And so for that one little two block space, you decided to constrict traffic, which anybody who thinks about traffic engineering would know that that would immediately create a traffic jam there. And that's, of course, what it does. And most of the time of the day, 
There's a line of cars there when it used to be a wonderful little intersection for me to leave my house and come back to my house. So anyhow, I, would, I, I appreciate I, you put your hand up that you're guilty of it. I just want to make sure I know who not to vote for in this next election. It will not be you, amongst other people. And, uh, and then if anybody could explain to me what the thinking was behind it, I'm all ears. Thank you. Any further public comment? Okay, seeing none, we will come back to staff and city council comments uh, and we'll start with staff. Sure, Mayor, the council wanted to quickly announce that yesterday is a amazing event here on the wharf. Uh, I just want to express the sound of it. Maybe closer. You can talk and take the advice. Um, I just want to not introduce the recreation department and staff and the department who put in so much running the event. It was just wonderful to see everyone out there. I know public works so hard. So it was a great opportunity to see what that I'm sure council members may have comments. Well, we also going to come out great event coming up next week, which is on Tuesday night, the community right here at 6 o'clock. We're going to be hosting a um, workshop to uh, talk about our community planning process. So if anybody's interested in kind of long term about the opportunity, we'd love to see you at 6 o'clock next Tuesday. If you can't make them up, if you'd also like to participate, we have a really interactive Inside the strategic plan, surveys, poll questions, um, all kinds of things that can participate. So I encourage anybody who's interested to go to the city's website and click on the plan link for more information. Thank you. All right, we'll go to council comments and we'll start on this end. Councilmember Clark. Great. I'd like to echo what the city manager said. It was a glorious day to say the least. Um, opening up the wharf to everybody, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was nice to uh, see that we had a, a, an extra porta potty out there and it was used pretty well. I was just wondering if maybe we could keep it there to get through the beach festival and uh, the fishing derby and some other things. Just, just a thought I had. Um, let me put that to staff. Uh, and then uh, last of all, I'd like to challenge the chief and Jamie <laughs> once again to a paddle race on Sunday. And uh, I don't know, we can have a cold beverage whoever, forever that wins gets a free one or something like that. But <laughs> I would still like to challenge you guys at 9 o'clock at the wharf. I'll be there. Thanks. I will be there too if that happens. <laughs> um, comments? Yeah, I just wanted to say um, thank you for everybody that came out yesterday for the work grand opening. It was a great turnout. Um, it looks great out there. I know it was not easy to get to where we got, but... Everybody, I think, enjoyed themselves, and I'm looking forward to see more of what we can do out there. All right, council comments? Um, nothing unique to add, but just echoing our fellow council members and city managers' sentiments about the wharf opening. It was a very inspirational event, and if you haven't had the chance to go there, check it out. It's beautiful. It's very fun. Um, yes, that was an incredible event. I you know, if, if we could get a head count, that would be amazing. I, I'm guessing over a thousand people showed up, and um, there is not enough um, accolades in the world to to appreciate staff time, um, CWEPs, dedication, council being out there, our um, agencies that supported the rebuild in record time. So, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone that showed up. Um, I had a other couple of updates. Um, Councilmember Clark and I met with um, a few uh, applicants to fill the Capitola Youth Liaison positions. We had 14 students apply for um, to be a Capitola Youth Liaison. And for our audience, um, what that is is a student we pick, and we um, we each mentor them throughout their school year. They get a stipend at the end. It's funded by our dedicated TOT, um, our dedicated children's um, fund, and so um, just to get them engaged in government. So um, we picked two and more to come on that. We get to start work with them pretty soon here. Um, in regards to the traffic study that's taking place at Knob Hill intersection that we all unanimously voted for um, in support of safety in the community, and that's why we did it. Um, it was through a traffic study. Um, we, under I understand that there will be a two-month 
close of the on-ramp coming up on Bay Porter, and I'm really concerned about that and how it's going to possibly skew the, um, the data we're trying to collect to see if it's effective or not. Um, so I'd like for, our, um, for Ms. Khan to look at the possibilities of pausing the um, collection of data, not the intersection itself. We have a lot of kiddos out there who are riding their bikes. And I know we've received some feedback about the confusion of color. We're still very confused. I'm still very confused of what blue means and, and the purpose of that. Um, and I know there were some options during the traffic study that was presented to us on um, some adjustments we can make. And I'm really hoping we can see those done before the on-ramp closes and here in just a few days. I know that's a short turnaround, um, but I would really appreciate that. Um, thank you, Councilmember Clark, for um, mentioning the bathrooms. I think that's really important to have those um, continue on, not just throughout the events um, happening this weekend for um, this busy weekend, but possibly looking at um, keeping that over. I know we have another event in October for, um, and just whether we can just keep them out there a little bit longer and what that would look like in terms of cost rather than putting them on and then taking them off. And then also um, placement for the toilets. I, I think um, they get a little stinky, and I'm concerned that they're so close to um, that shop, that the boat and bait shop, and whether we can do something about that, there's a better spot for them. Um, let's see. The last time I, we, uh, that I, we had a council comment, I asked about the long-term wharf plan. I requested that it go out to... All of the committees, or maybe I had it opposite, the strategic plan would go out to all of the committees. Um, I just want to make sure that it goes the long-term wharf plan um, survey and the strategic plan st survey go to all of our committees. So that's Planning Commission, FAC, Chiefs Council, Environmental Commission, the Museum, Art and Cultural, that each of those committees have it agendized to complete those um, those surveys because their input is really really critical and I am um, not just with the strategic plan but as well as the um, the wharf the long term wharf plan so if we can make sure that the staff that each govern each of those committees can agendize that um, and I think that's it for now so thank you. <laughs> Um, I will just briefly echo what everyone else has said about yesterday's wharf grand opening. It was a really heartwarming and exciting event to see so much life on the wharf again after, after a year of virtually nothing. So thank you everyone who participated. Anyone who hasn't been out there yet, please go check it out. The artwork is, is beautiful, the mosaics, there's viewfinders. Um, there will soon be educational exhibits out there. There's going to be a scavenger hunt with bronze fish inlaid into the decking that uh, lets children kind of uh, find cool things along the way to the end of the wharf. Um, please go check it out, and uh, it's been it's been really exciting. Um, I will also um, add a little bit to what Vice Mayor Brooks said about the Bay and Hill Street intersection quick build project. If you go to our website, cityofcapitola.org, on the very front page is um, a link to information about the Bay and Hill Street intersection quick build. And at the bottom of that page, you can also find the intersection operations analysis from a traffic engineer, uh, the improvement, safety improvement community meeting presentation, project updates, final layout, project plans. It is part of a longer term uh, study of traffic operations between uh, the free Highway 1 exit on Bay Street all the way down to Monterey that's going to be taking place over the next year or two, several years. I can't remember. Jamie, is it a year? The long-term Bay Street. How long do we anticipate the overall study? The plan right now is to come back to the council this winter mm -hmm. with sort of data options and sort of plan to move forward. Okay. And that's also looking at that overall data for this is what you're asking corridor study. Yes, the yeah. corridor study. With, with the information from the corridor study. Perfect. Um, so yes, once uh, take a look at that information. Any questions you have, any comments, please feel free to send them uh, to the council and or staff, and we'll keep the conversation going. Here, if I uh, may add one thing. Yes. Uh, since we've been talking about the great things on the wharf, I was wondering if the city can work on this along with maybe the BIA, maybe doing a monthly festival, music, or whatever, yeah, once, once a month weather permitting until next summer instead of just ending everything in October. It'd be nice if we can continue 
kind of grow on that. Just wanted to float the idea. Are you asking for a future agenda item or just have staff look into it? Or? I would just like to have staff look into it at this time. Okay. Thank you. Staff got the direction? Okay. And then I'm, I'm going to take a moment of selfishness just to announce something not related to the council at all, which is that my niece was elected to student council yesterday. And so I just want to take a moment to recognize the newest member, newest elected official in our family at the ripe age of nine. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll give, yeah. I, think, I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it. She can't hear us. She's not watching. I just had to say it. Um, okay. With that, uh, I think we will move on now to uh, our consent items. Item seven. Um, is there any member of the council that would like to remove an item from consent? Hearing none. I can move the consent item 7A through F. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We'll move on to item 8, general government. 8A is discussion of a dog park at Noble Gulch Park. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. We are here to discuss uh, the potential for dog park facility at Noble Gulch Park. Next slide, please. So for those who are not familiar, Noble Gulch Park is at the intersection of Bay and Monterey Avenues. Um, it is also bordered by uh, Noble Creek. It is accessible currently from the adjacent sidewalk that is on one side of Monterey. There is no sidewalk on the other side of Monterey. And there is vehicular access into the park for both a city and a county of Santa Cruz facilities. There is a sewer manhole back there, as well as the city staff maintains the creek. Uh, there's existing benches, tables. There's a narrow pathway that connects the front of the park at the intersection to the rear of the park down Monterey Avenue. Um, and there are a few ADA barriers currently to this park. They're not quite accessible. Um, uh, during the July 25th, 2024 council meeting during the discussion about dogs and city facilities in general, uh, council directed staff to evaluate the feasibility of a dog park in this location. So here we are. Next slide, please. Um, so there's a few key considerations for converting part of the uh, park into a dog park. Um, some with a setback from the intersection, both for dog and people safety. Uh, as noted, there's sidewalk only on one side of Monterey Avenue, so we wanted to keep some of the boundaries of the park away from the sidewalk as that's the main route to the middle school. Um, and then also fencing on the creek side to keep any dogs out of the creek for environmental reasons. Um, current park conditions, um, the rear of the park is not irrigated. There is some volunteer turf there, but it is not maintained. Um, we did speak as directed to some of the dog uh, park proponents. Uh, for this evaluation, and they did express a preference for turf over wood chips and also expressed a concern about the drainage issues in the winter. Um, we would need to improve the ADA access on the site. Once you start modifying a site, you are required to make it ADA accessible. Um, and then potential amenities for this site, um, besides the fencing, would be a potential water fountain with dog bowl. And then there would be a need for a waste receptacle specifically for dog waste and then also updated signage for rules for being a dog park. Um, so based on staff evaluation and then also a consultation with the dog proponents, um, we came to the conclusion that hog wire fencing for the entry gates and vehicle access gates would be the most cost effective uh, for, a, for this project. Uh, ADA improvements would be a concrete pad and accessible Amenities, and there are following slides that uh, detail this. Uh, to maintain the existing furnishings, to update the signage, and then potentially delay any installation of water fountain, as that is quite a pricey item. Next slide. Um, so this is the potential layout for the dog park. Um, this was included in your agenda packet. As noted, the fencing is uh, set back on the bottom of the slope there, away from the sidewalk. There'd be vehicle access gates, one where the curb cut currently is, and then one to get down into the creek, and then that concrete pad with amenities adjacent to the sidewalk. Uh, the hog wire fence, or the, um, excuse me, split rail fencing there is yellow at the bottom, would remain. Um, there's also a water service currently to the park, but that is um, closer to the intersection. Next slide. Um, so when we say hog wire fence, I mean that fencing to the right, that's wood within the hog wire. In between, other types of fencing typically used for dog parks 
are vinyl coated chain link fencing. They are stronger, uh, they last longer. And it is also very common to have the hog wire fencing that's currently the fencing at the dog park at Chanticleer County Park that is uh, relatively new. Um, also requested is a dog corral, which is a uh, interior fence inside the bigger fenced areas to prevent dogs from running in and out by only having one entryway. Next slide. Uh, ADA improvements would include a stable surface. Here would be a concrete pad. Uh, ADA rules require that any amenities you have in the park either have the same amenity and the ADA accessible portion or only be in the ADA accessible portion. Uh, so these are examples of other dog parks where you can see the corral is all concrete. And then outside of the corral where you have your bench, your trash can, and water fountain would also be in that same ADA accessible area. Um, there is a concern about parking for this park. Uh, we do have the city lower lot directly across uh, Bay Avenue from this portion, but there are also a few spots in the neighborhood depending on how people park, um, approximately nine to 10. Next slide, please. And then as for the fiscal impact of this conversion, this is not currently budgeted in the 24-25 fiscal year budget. There is a potential to uh, add it in the mid-year later on or include in the next fiscal year budget. Uh, the highest price for this is the fencing. The fencing is about $43,000. That is for the hog wire fencing. Uh, if we wanted to go with something, um, the chain link fencing would be about $7,000 more. Um, the concrete pad is also quite pricey at about $20,000. And we've done quite a few concrete pads around here lately, and that is the going rate for a concrete pad. Um, the amenities total would be about 23, 23,500. And so the entire cost for the dog park without the water fountain is estimated at around $66,000. Um, so with that, we have the recommended action on the board. If we did want to move forward with um, the dog park proposal either now or in the future, it would require a coastal development permit, which language was included in your packet. Um, looking forward to your feedback and options for funding this would go on to future budget discussions. Also, there's potential for staff to seek donations or community fundraising. Uh, recently, we've been doing that for the playground at JH Street Park and then also the pump track at um, McGregor. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Questions? I just had one question. Um, so the earth that's there, we would end up covering that with turf, or would we just leave it as is? Like The proposal is to leave it as is, okay. but it is not irrigated or maintained and does get money in the winter, which would likely result in intermittent closures. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have a couple questions. So first, um, I'm assuming there no drainage is included. That right in, in the price that you outlined uh is that a possibility to you know have less impact by more rain it, like would it be simple enough to include include drainage <clears throat> so that we didn't have to close as often that would be a significant um a significant, cost increase yes. yeah, okay <laughs> you can't just like great yeah okay um and then the other question i had was regarding the um, border and um, going towards Bay and how that was determined. Because I thought in the last time we were talking about this, we were talking about really maximizing the area of the dog park and going even into the grass area. Yeah, Does I, anybody else remember? Yeah, I specifically asked that the whole park be a dog park because there was some people that came and noted that they had some accessibility issues with walking down the hill. And I think even if it's not, can we go back to that slide? Even if it's not literally the whole park, if we can find a way to get more of the um, dog park area, the fenced in area be the upper grassy spot, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, and, and to add to that, um, because there's already water going to the grassy area, that would reduce costs to put in a water fountain at a later date. Oh, yeah. Those are my questions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I also heard from the community about losing that upper space. I'm wondering, 
Jessica, if there is an option to flip so, sort of that, that model there. Um, so on the left-hand side, the outside of that orange circle to Mayor Brown and Councilmember Peterson's point is to move it up higher and then reduce the other side so that we still have a park area down below. I'm just trying to like maintain the park option for people that do like to grab lunch and sit down that don't want to be inside the park. Just trying to think of best of both worlds there. Um, so that's somewhat of a question. Um, and then the second part is the quote on turf. I'm not seeing the cost on turf on here. And um, optional items, was there, if we can get that, if we can get that, um, that cost. Um. So a few answers there. Uh, in my review of going back and listening to council member comments, the one I guess I overheard was, right, preserving the park area for park users, which I assume was the front of the park. Um, there was an idea, there was also the consideration of keeping the dog fencing away from being directly adjacent to the sidewalk because it is the main uh, route for the um, students going to school. Apparently, I've misinterpreted exactly where the fencing was. I will say yeah, that. I don't think you, no, I think we had both conversations. You did not misinterpret that, no. Um, but to move the fencing, I would say, in the scope of the budget here would be minor. That, that wouldn't be a whole lot of cost difference. I will say the reason we put the ADA spot where it is is because that is a flatter area of the park already. And so we're trying to get something that we wouldn't have to significantly grade. Um, as far as turf, the front of the park near the intersection is um, maintained and irrigated. Um, the rear of the park is not. So to have that have turf would also need to add an irrigation component to it. And also there's a lot of trees and doesn't get a whole lot of sun. So that would be a significant cost to uh, establish and maintain at the rear of the park. They're just comments on this. One other, one other factor that I know we looked at was we were trying to try to make find that balance. Uh, you council member, Vice Mayor Brooks's point about having maintaining an area where people could still go and have lunch that's outside the dog park. And so trying to figure out where the flat spot was, where the existing benches were, and sort of eat, um, picnic tables were. And so that was kind of how we ended up, I think, with the spot that we did for the fence. Could it be moved a little bit? You know, I think if the council gave us that direction, like Director Khan said, I think we can tweak it. I don't think it's a huge cost, but there was... It was kind of, it seemed like a natural spot for it there that was flat, it was at the pen, it was accessible off the sidewalk, and it left some amenities inside, some amenities outside. So my follow-up question then is, if we move it, can we access that irrigation line in order to have turf? Because then, it, I mean, that would, all, for me, it would be more reason to do that if we moved it minimally. That would be my hope, is to minimally move it so that we can access irrigation because my concern is that the end of it will become muddy and just unusable for a majority of the, you know, however many months it rains here. Um, and it just becomes more of a, a public works issue constantly to have to maintain and clean it just, you know, more work than being used. And so when, I'm curious about that. So yes, moving part of the park to the front of the park to include irrigation or use the irrigation that's already there would be significantly less than trying to irrigate the rear of the park. And as I stated earlier, to move some of that fencing would be a marginal cost. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I just um, remembered one more question regarding the fence line um, on the adjacent to Monterey. It looks like there's about maybe, what is that, 12, 15 feet gap between the sidewalk and um, the fence line, the proposed fence line that encompasses the slope. I'm wondering um, if you have any estimate on how it would change the cost to move that back up, because that, I mean, just looking at it, it looks like you're losing almost maybe 15 to 20 percent of the total area of the park there. And if there's significant challenges in having the fence on the sloped portion, well, I'm still maintaining a gap between the sidewalk, but something, you know, of a couple feet rather than uh, the entire slope. We did cost out putting the fence both where it is on the picture here and then also at the top of the slope. And the costs for those are the same. To put it on the slope might be a bit more expensive, but again, not significant. 
Okay, so, so yeah, the any... answer to your question is yes. <laughs> so there's probably not a significant um, drawback in, in moving that up, it sounds like. Correct. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just have a, a couple of comments and or questions. So I guess I'm looking on um, Google Earth, and there's the one big tree on the corner of Monterey and Bay there. And there's a bench there, and then you walk, and there's um, a table with kind of benches built into it, and then two more trees, and then another table with benches built into it on the other side of that, uh, those two trees. And so I'm, I'm kind of feeling like we could move that fence up further and still allow for at least a bench and a table with chairs to be outside of the dog area, because I, I really specifically remember some people being concerned that if we're only putting the dog park down where you have to walk down that slope, then some people aren't going to be able to use it just because of um, accessibility issues. But even if we didn't want to move the whole fence, even if we could do, you know, a longer, like a dog run that leads up to the dog park down at the bottom, I think that would be fine too. Just something so that people who have difficulty walking down a hill would still be able to, to utilize this space, I think would be important. Um, and then... I think the rest of what I have are comments. Yes, okay, that's it for me. All right, with that, we will go to public comment. Hi, welcome. Thank you, City Council. My name is Dave Montgomery. Um, a couple of items for great job on the wharf. I was down there yesterday, fantastic. Uh, it actually made the evening news on a couple of the Bay Area stations. It was another little segment, so good job all around. Um, I'm here to be very supportive of uh, Jessica and the Department of Public Works proposal for the Noble Gulch Park. I think it's a great idea. Um, the council has already discussed the concerns about drainage and what I would like would be an estimate on what it would cost incrementally in case we dog owners want to do a GoFundMe program or Kickstarter to try to sort of kick in to actually replace the turf there because I understand it's a significant uh, extra expense that wasn't in the budget. But just want to say I very much appreciate the quick response of the city and come up with this plan. And I think it's a beautiful dog park uh, proposal. And I would like to see it go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you. I thought parks were for people. <laughs> And now we have dog parks and skate parks kind of dominating. That's one problem I see. I, I think that's a gorgeous park as it is, as it exists now. Personally, I'd like to see it that way. You've uh, brought up issues of drainage and parking and maintenance. Uh, those, those are real problems around this. And also, as I'm looking at item A, Dog Park at Nobel Park, um, it says, defer the funding decision to future budget discussions and or direct staff to assess interest in donations and or community fundraising for the project. So it seems like the funds aren't there at this time. And I've been noticing other projects like with the downtown library, huge plan, and the funding isn't there and it strikes me. I mean, I think I have common sense it seems like the funding needs to be there before proceeding. The other problem I see is this is quite near New Brighton Middle School, right? The kids go by and stuff. Um, my preference is to see it as it is. And I wonder, how did this come forward? Did dog owners ask? You to make this into a dog park is that is that why it seems this is a, I love dogs I like to pet other people's dogs I'm a cat person but um, it just seems like this is geared towards limited interests of dog interests where it's a, a public park for everybody 
So those are my comments. I appreciate some responses to my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments on this item? Okay. Seeing none, we will bring it back to council for discussion and a vote. And we'll start with discussion comments. Yeah, I'd like to uh, thank staff. I think it's a great idea. I, I like the plan we have. Um, there is natural drainage there from the, the top of the slope that goes all the way down into the creek. So I, th I don't know if we really need to worry about drainage, although it might be a good idea to look into it um, and maybe getting some more sod or something down there. Um, but it's a good plan, and I, I like to see it move forward. Oh, yeah, so I wanted to touch back on, um, I think there was miscommunication from last meeting when we talked about moving the fence um, closer towards Bay. Um, I was in opposition of that only because, yes, I did want to maintain park access that people have had access to. Um, but, and, and just having dogs be so close to the street, that was my other concern, was just like anything can really happen. Um, uh, so I, I'm wondering if we want to look into um, kind of what Yvette was saying, um, maybe even changing the shape of the pen or the fencing to more of like an L where you will have some access into kind of where, um, I'm not sure the address of that house, but it's right up against there that maybe it would go further up towards the street that way, but then still maintain like a blocked off area that has the picnic tables and benches and things like that. Um, that's just an idea to maybe utilize more of that green grass space um, over the non-turfed area. Um, and I, I'm really excited about this. I think it looks great. Um, have we, is there any, um, I guess this was a question, sorry, for a pathway for, I, I'm, it would be an extra cost obviously, but um, for ADA accessibility or is the pad really all that we need to focus on as far as accessibility. The pad makes it legally accessible. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, and the parking, I'm not super concerned about. I, I mean, I think we heard a lot from the public that most of these people are walking their dogs to the um, place that they're using. Um, I think um, it is important. I don't think that the space has been totally utilized to its full potential. So I think that this is a great idea. Um, we did have a lot of dog owners in the community that have been using a space right on the school property, which is definitely not where you want dogs and kids to mix. So I think that this is a great idea to really have a designated area um, that the city and the community has come together to agree upon. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to move forward. And um, I definitely think looking into I mean, we've seen an outpouring of fundraising efforts from the community. I think that this is a great opportunity for those that might be interested in, and if Mr. Montgomery is interested in sort of spearheading that, I think he's done a lot of work with this already, so I think he could be an asset. Um, so thank you for all the hard work, and I'm excited to see this go through. Thank you. Yeah, I have some comments. I'm really excited about this project as well, and think we're off to a great start. I would um, recommend in maximizing the area that we can by pushing the border closer to uh, Monterey. Um, and I would also recommend moving the border towards Bay. I think, I'm not sure exactly what you said, but maybe towards like the first redwood tree. Is that what you were saying, Chris? The first redwood tree is right on Bay, so I wouldn't go that far. No, I mean, well, the second redwood tree. Yeah, the second. There's or like the third, one, the one that stands alone, and then a Yeah, and then pair. the two. A yeah, somewhere tree. around those two, I think, would be appropriate, because that would leave plenty of room for, I mean, I go by there, like, all the time. I live in that neighborhood, and there's, if ever if there's anybody, there's, like, one person. And if we need to put more benches to accommodate more people in that, other area towards Bay, I think that's what we should do. But um, I honestly don't see the need. And I think this is going to be an awesome project to really maximize community use of our parks. Um, I think if I have anything else, I think, I think that's it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Montgomery, for working tirelessly on this and being patient with us as we process and figure out a happy medium of, of getting us 
um, as well as the rest of the neighbors who've come out in support of dogs um, and cats. So um, I like the, the term you used um, of incremental modifications. I think that's really key in finding this happy medium. I, um, I hear what um, my colleagues are sharing about utilizing the whole space. I do have concerns about aesthetics um, with the wire, uh, with the hog wire fencing. And just so when we, if we move up aesthetically, I just want it to look pleasing. Right now it's beautiful looking at that green space and um, having that, you know, with the, the trees and all of that. Um, so I, I think there's a happy median in between how far we move it out and how far away from they have. Um, and so I'd like to see, see some more ideas come forward about that. Um, and I agree with Council Member Peterson about keeping the tables and the benches and just moving that all out up so we can have that space more used um, than ever before. Um, I also appreciate that our community is helping us um, or interested in helping us with like a GoFundMe or um, fundraising. As you heard, our budget is limited at this time. Um, and so to it seems like there's opportunity and and um, and finding some support with the community. And so thank you for offering that. Um, so um, I think that's all you needed today. Am I right? Just feedback on where we want to go with this. Um, so I'm in support of of the ideas, and I think you have enough. We do need to vote on the coastal development permit at some point. And that's it. Okay. Um, um, just for sake of 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 um, a vote, I'll go ahead and make an. Uh, a motion to approve the coastal development permit um, today. And I will second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. I just have a couple comments. Um, when we talk about turf, are we talking about natural turf or artificial turf? I'm assuming it's natural turf, right? Yeah, okay, just making sure. Um, and then, you know, I based on the, the public concern, public comment concern about funding, and, you know, clearly there will not be construction or development until there's funding for it. We're not gonna move forward in doing something we don't have money for yet. Um, but I do think um, that there is community interest in, in fundraising and potentially getting some donations. So I think we should explore that um, and see where it leads us. Comments? Yeah, before you vote, maybe just to try to get clarity on what I think we heard in terms of feedback around the fencing. I'm gonna do my best to summarize. Should I take a swing at it? All right. I think we heard trying to maximize the area in the dog park, bringing the fence forward towards Monterey, but understanding not bringing it right up to the sidewalk. I think that's what I heard from Vice Mayor Brooks, Councilmember Peterson. You were saying you know you thought that maybe some of that usable space on the slope could be utilized. So trying to scoot it towards Monterey to the extent that it's feasible. Is that okay? That that's clear. Does that sound okay? And then looking at making trying to incorporate more of the grass area into the overall design, but still trying to maintain a grassy space at that area, maybe aiming for the double the double redwood trees. Does that sort of kind of frame the feedback? Yeah, and I think the why, if I'm hearing Mayor Brown, um, of moving the fencing up is because although the um, legally all we need is the ADA Square by doing this is a little bit more for the community, and so I that's the the why behind that. And so whatever that median is of moving the fencing to an area that makes sense for that is I think the why behind why we're asking for that today. Thank you. Just one quick comment. Um, I just wanted to say that yeah, hog wire fence. I'm a big fan of. I think it is really aesthetically pleasing especially compared to the normal chain link fence, it can look really nice. The name does not do it justice, so. <laughs> no hogs allowed at the dog park. Okay, uh, only well-trained hogs. Uh, any further comments, questions, concerns? Okay, uh, all right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Oh, excuse oh, me, right. oh. before, before the vote, could I just clarify that the motion is to approve the coastal development permit based on the findings laid out in the staff report? Yes. 
Okay. We have a motion to second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We will move on to item 8B, Daylighting Law AB 413, Village Parking. Welcome back. <laughs> Um, this is a little bit more of a technical conversation, so please feel free to ask questions. So AB uh, 413 was voted on, um, or was, next slide, can't go off memory. Um, so the recommended action here is to review the 18th, AB 413 compliance approach in the village and then also citywide, which is towards the end of the conversation, and then approve the coastal development permit for the um, change in the uh, parking spaces available in the village. Next slide, please. So California Assembly Bill 413 was approved back in 2023, which are, um, prohibits basically parking right at an intersection where there's a crosswalk. And the definition of crosswalk is something pretty specific that we'll get into in a following slide. Um, the exceptions to this rule are uh, commercial loading zones, very specifically commercial loading zones um, for commercial businesses, not just any kind of loading zone in general. Um, on bicycle or scooter parking, all must have uh, appropriate signage to go with them. Um, this is a citable offense, but not until January 1st of 2025, and the law became in effect January 1st of this year. Next slide, please. Um, so daylighting is basically removing parking spots out of the vision triangle. So when you are stopped at a uh, stop sign or at an intersection, if there are cars parked immediately at the intersection right behind the crosswalk, it is often difficult to see pedestrians attempting to cross the street. So the concept is to remove those parking spots right um, as you're approaching an intersection. So now you can visibly see or daylight those who are trying to go across the crosswalk. Next slide, please. This is more of a street view of that. You can see there that the SUV is parked legally um, or legally at the time, um, adjacent to the sidewalk. And then by removing that, you can see that the mom and kid was there the whole time and the bike, and we don't want to run them over. And so we're going to get rid of these parking spaces. Next slide. Um, this is only applicable for the approaching side, so it's actually a little bit difficult to see in this slide. But if you're going left across the top of this street, that blue one there would be the one that needs to be removed for daylighting, not the one on the... Um, driver's side of the street. So it's just the approaching side uh, spaces that are affected. Next slide. Um, and a crosswalk is really anywhere where two streets, two streets meet at a right angle. So in this slide, there are three crosswalks. Um, the one that's number three, the little star there, is what is an unmarked crosswalk, but is legally a crosswalk in the state of California. Crosswalks are also those that are not at intersections, but are just marked across, as crosswalks. Uh, for example, we have those coming off of Long Way at the Esplanade, which are just crosswalks, not in an intersection, but we have marked them as crosswalks, so they have to be treated as such. Next slide, please. Um, so to reach this in clients, we had our traffic engineer, Kimberly Horn, go out and do an evaluation and a lot of measuring of all of the intersections and existing crosswalks in the village and found that eight of our marked spaces were affected. Uh, then Captain Ryan and I uh, had a meeting with BIA representatives on each of the spots affected to see their opinions on uh, how we should mitigate these spaces. Like I said, we can have commercial loading there, we can have bike parking there, we could just have no parking there. So we went over staff recommendations with those BIA representatives. Um, the recommendations that came out of that were uh, the conversion of four parking spaces to commercial loading zones and then a net spot of loss of three spaces, which are on the following slide. Next slide, please. Uh, so this first slide here is Capitol Avenue and Stockton Avenue. The uh, parking lot you see there on the top is for the Quality Market. Currently, there are two loading zone spaces there adjacent to the Quality Market that aren't related to daylighting, but are currently there. Um, and then the spaces affected by the daylighting are the ones in front of the David Ling building and then that other uh, property there on the uh, right side. Um, so the recommendation here is to make the um, one there on the left, right-hand side, a 24-hour uh, loading zone, and then to swap the current loading zones that aren't affected by daylighting with the spots that are. So we would have no net loss between those two spots. Yeah. Next slide, please. Um, here we are at Monterey and Lawn Way. 
Um, the part uh, space in yellow there in front of the Mexican restaurant, El Toro Bravo, is currently a loading zone. It is not a 24-hour loading zone. And so that would be converted into a 24-hour loading zone. And then the spot there adjacent to the parking lot and Britannia Arms would be proposed as bike parking, which is convenient to Esplanade Park. Next slide, please. Uh, here we're at the bottom of Lawn Way. And so the two spots there um, are regular metered parking spots that are affected. One uh, was a recommended to be a 24 hour loading zone. And then the removal of the spot in the blue there is currently an ADA parking space. Uh, so we would convert the spot with a white car to the left of the blue spot to our ADA parking space. And then the spot that we're removing would be the striping that is legally required for an ADA parking space. Next slide, please. Uh, and then here we are at Esplanade and San Jose Avenue. Um, there, the proposal would be to put bike parking there uh, next to the lawn area and then commercial loading in front of Zelda's. Again, uh, any of these spots could be bark, bike parking. Any of these spots could just be painted red curb. Any of these spots could be loading zones per the uh, AB413. Next slide, please. Um, so we did the evaluation, particularly in the village, because we know how sensitive village parking is, uh, both to our... Uh, residents and visitors and to the business owners. Um, AB413 is applicable to every single crosswalk in the city. Um, the proposal would be to limit curb painting of the red zones to commercial zones, parks, and schools. It's not very practical to go paint every curb in town. Many um, residential areas in town don't have curbs to paint. Um, this is a statewide law. Uh, this is a statewide law in many other states across the country where people over time learn just not to park next to the intersection. Um, again, um, enforcement of this law would not be until January 1st, 2025. Many other cities around the state have um, been doing social media campaigns to educate their residents about this new law. Uh, these particular ones are nice. They are kind of like the swipey ones on Instagram where you get to learn all about the law and what daylighting is. Uh, from the city of San Diego, but there are many, many examples of ways we can push this out on the city's social media sites. Next slide. Uh, the fiscal impact of this is pretty marginal. It was included in the 24-25 budget, it includes staff time and paint to go paint curbs, um, some additional bike racks and delineators, and then signage uh, where it's required at the loading zones where it doesn't already exist. Uh, the bike parking proposed is that that was already approved from this village uh, sidewalk dining program. So that is that top kind of squiggly one at uh, on the top left. And then uh, the way it would be arranged in the parking spot would be striped white with delineators. And then that uh, U-shaped um, parking, uh, bike parking instead of the other U-shaped parking in the, uh, in the uh, spot. Next slide, please. Uh, so with that, the recommendation, recommended action is on the screen, and I am happy to go over any of those other intersections or answer any other questions you may have. Thank you. Questions? I'll start off with a question. Um, I do think it's a great idea for us to do this for safety reasons, but have we thought of making the Esplanade uh, a pedestrian zone, eliminating the, the crosswalks? And what other cities have done is they make it a pedestrian zone and then they limit the speed limit between five and 10 miles an hour and they don't have to have the crosswalks and there we don't, therefore we don't lose any of our parking spaces. So that's definitely something cities have done um, before this law and then also uh, because of this law. I would say that's probably more of a capital improvement project just because to change driver behavior, you really want something that is different on the street. So if we're still going to allow cars on the street, which it sounds like we would still want cars to park be able to drive down the esplanade you'd want like a different texture a different color in addition to just lowering the speed limit so people change their behavior if we're going to have a bunch of people purposefully in the street <laughs> i have a question um i guess i'm a little confused as to why we would take away a parking spot but then still allow commercial loading because if it's a commercial vehicle, I feel like it would be quite large compared to just a normal car. And if you were allowing it for 24 hours a day, how is that any different than having a car parked there? So there's restrictions to how long a commercial vehicle can be parked. It's restricted to loading and unloading. The yeah, 24 hours a day is just that 
Right now, some of our commercial parking yeah. is right just half. Totally, day. yeah. Right, so it's just that is all the time. It is limited to commercial loading and unloading, which if they're there longer than a specified amount of time, it's citable. Okay. I just see it still kind of being an issue, but. I think it's just the way the law was written. So I don't know that there's necessarily, you know, that's one of the allowed uses you can put into that space. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I have one question. Um, see, could you go back to the slide for Esplanade slash San Jose Avenue? So there's the, um, the parking spot at the bottom of that slide in yellow for 24 hour loading. And it, are th those umbrellas are um, outdoor dining. It's gone now. Yeah. Okay. Forget it then. That was my question. Um. Oh. Okay. Cool. You mentioned you've you've reached out to the BIA. Um. Did you get consensus from the group on on? the recommend, recommended actions today? Yes, we went out and did a walk. We did have some follow-up questions and a summary of the findings in the staff report were sent to them prior to the agenda. Okay, and so they, they, they agreed that that was the best. Okay, thank you. Um, how many new 24-hour parkings are there gonna be? I know it says it's loading, unloading. Sorry, that's what I meant. Um, so off the top of my head, two of them are switched, so there's a no net there. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is already a uh, loading zone half of the day, so it's half a spot, and then there were two others, I believe. The two and a half, two and a half. increased. And it, I'm just wondering, like, is that really needed by the – is it more mostly commercial, I'm guessing? Correct, commercial loading, yes. Right. Strictly I commercial loading and unloading, not like unload your beach stuff. And Correct. Yeah, I'm just wondering if that is really needed. Has there been, um, you know, has anybody from the BIA or business owners down there actually asked for additional loading space? To my knowledge, no one has requested additional loading zones, but I do think that part of the idea was to not lose parking in, in general in the village, and that was still a parking use. Um, but had anyone asked specifically for we need more loading zones in the village? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Yeah, because I just wonder if it wouldn't be better suited to bicycles than loading if there's not an actual need for loading. And I trust me, I love parking in in the village and you know elsewhere in Capitola, but mostly for you know tourists. I mean, for if there's a need, right? If there's not a need for parking because it's so restricted, then it could be better suited for bicycles, which I believe there will be a large need for sometime soon. Um, so you you mentioned the swapping of the two. Where's the one that we're swapping with? Um, next to the quality market, there's currently two loading zone spaces, and they are not near an intersection. And so we would be moving those loading zone spaces to near the intersection where the daylighting is affecting allowable parking, and then those two loading zone spaces would just be regular metered parking. So the loading zones, can you pull it back up on the thing and show me? I'm trying to visualize. So the loading zones that exist now are in front of David Ling, or they're about to be in front of David Ling. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I love all the bike parking. How many spaces are we losing citywide? So you said there's like a couple in the village, but do we know in the whole city? Quite a few. But okay. Yeah, citywide it, it is every intersection where there is parking. You cannot park within twenty feet of the intersection. So in the places, like you said, there's not going to be um, painting and all that in, in every intersection, which I understand why we can't do that. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking there's a lot of intersections in our city. So what are we going to do to make sure people don't park there? So we will be part painting some intersections, so near schools, other commercial zones. I put some other category in the staff report, but places where we expect a lot of pedestrians to be and where it's most important. Um, and then other than that, it's really just education and outreach. Yeah, and that has been effective in other states where this uh, 
has been a similar laws have been passed. Is it going to be enforced by law enforcement come January? Are people going to get tickets if they park in an unmarked? In, are, are the people going to get tickets if they park on a corner where they don't know that they can't park because it's not marked? It's a citable offense, but <laughs> feedback from from the police department. I think on how their approach will be to. I mean, I think. Come on up. <laughs> Come on up. I could start winging it, but let's hear from Captain Ryan. Well, another question I have, we're waiting to get up here. Like, like Clear Street, where they added all the new crosswalks, we're going to lose eight parking spots, and those would probably have to be painted red because they're used every day, all day long. Correct. So the short answer is that, yes, eventually people will be cited, but um, what we'll do is we'll make sure that we do a lot of education and outreach to make sure that people understand and clearly having it marked, um, you know, will specify explicitly that they cannot park there, but there will be an adjustment phase and we're aware of that. I have a question. Yeah. Well, following that up. So I originally thought that we were talking about not painting the curb red but there would still be signage. But now I'm thinking, is there not going to be any notification? That's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to get to is, uh, will there be some spaces where there's no signage, no painting, no markings? Because we can't. We're just hoping. That. That's, yeah. no. that's what I mean. Hope, hope wouldn't, no, we wouldn't, we wouldn't enforce. No, okay. we, it would have to be clearly marked. Yeah, good. Okay. Yes. Then maybe we'll have to allocate that. And I, th I think, you know, this is, we all know that you can't park on a corner right now, and we don't have red paint around every corner in this town. And so part of it is, the mayor looks puzzled. You can park, what do you mean you can't park? Like literally on the uh, rounded part of the corner? Correct. Oh, well, yeah, okay. Right, so you know, th there's gonna be, I think, this adjustment period over time. We're gonna identify where the problem areas are. We're gonna be working on enforcement. We're gonna be working on education, like all of those different pieces of the puzzle. And sort of uh, probably, I think, over time, we'll learn where the places are where we really need to have red curbs, places where we don't, where things just sort of work by themselves. So I think there's going to be an adjustment period. Um, and it's not going to be on day one, all of a sudden, our officers are going to be out there ticketing everybody that has any issues. Sure, sure, of course not. I'm just worried. This seems like a pretty obscure yeah. law for uh, the public. I think <laughs> what you're hearing from council is that there needs to be grace given. and. Of um, because we can't assume that our community is going to know. And I think you're collectively hearing from us saying, please don't cite them for however long this adjustment period takes, especially if we're not budgeting in any funding to mark and put signs up at every single intersection. I don't know, you know, the legalities of how much grace time we can give. But I think collectively you're hearing us say that. And I think, I, I mean... That, that that could be an issue. I do have a second part question about the spaces that are not going to be there. Can those be bike, can the uh, bike racks be placed there? Can those spaces also be bike racks or loading zones? Yes. Um, will council be seeing, I know there's a lot, <laughs> but um, because I can't think about all of them, Will council see some sort of report on maybe some ideal areas to add additional bike? I'd like to see that um, because we keep hearing about traffic and there's a lot of e-bikes and bikes and, and different modes of transportation being taken. So if there's an opportunity to add more bike racks, that I think that would be ideal. And that would alleviate some of the issues of signage and red markings. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if even some of our B-cycle stations be moved into some of those spots. A few of them already are. Great. Oh, great. So I think maybe just a little bit more information and just kind of so that we're aware of where things are going and where the B cycles and where we can add some bike racks. Loading sounds great for some areas. I mean, I think it's great that it's going to be in front of Zelda's. They had, you know, there's cons. That's a great place. But in the rest of the community, you did outreach to the BIA. Um, but I wonder about the other business, you know, Brown Ranch, and I'm just making up names. I don't know the, remember the other one. Is that right? Okay. Um, yeah, King, King's Plaza. That, you know, maybe there's something there in those areas that they, there's need for. So um, if we can get some more information back to us so we can have a more 
grounded conversation. Um, I'm guessing, but I want to make sure, are these daylighted spots eligible for commercial use, like outdoor dining or any other commercial use? So the way the law is written is that it's very specifically commercial loading, bike and scooter parking. There may be one other use. I don't know that outdoor dining is one of them. Well, didn't it say you can't stop, like stand in those spaces either? Like when the first one of the first slides said you can't park, stand, or essentially like loiter in the spot. Stand there. So you would think outdoor dining would count as loitering. Yeah, I don't remember seeing that. Yeah. No standing in those spaces standing. either. Okay, must be moving. Right. Okay. Must be right. moving. Yeah. Um. Okay. I saw Jamie's face. You looked a little confused, Jamie, with my comments. And so, if you have a question, I'm happy to answer it. Okay. The first one. I think the stopping, standing, and parking that has to do with the vehicle code. That's vehicles. That's not people. Um, so I think it's legal for a person to be standing in that zone. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that. Um, I don't know. The slide looked a little like there might be some people standing in there. So like, what counts as a car stand? I'm sorry. Never mind. <laughs> I'm sorry. Not moving. <laughs> it's stopping. Um, so I guess I guess the question is, is, is council asking for us to come back with more information sort of on the citywide approach at this time? That's. That was, I think, probably the puzzled look that you saw. Sure. Yeah, I saw it. I saw it on your face. Um, you know, I think I love this. I'm fine with this. I appreciate you going out for the BIA and got their input. We also have a rest. It's going to affect the rest of the city. And so if you're asking us whether we approve bicycle, um, bike racks, and these things, I'm curious why we're not being asked about the rest of the city. Um, so maybe that's where I'll start there, and because you're just asking for us to give input for this one particular area. I think that's two pieces. One, down in the village, we have marked and metered spaces, and we can't be encouraging people to park in daylighted areas, so it's re required that we remove them. So that is why we did a study on that area specifically, because we knew that that was an issue. Um, as far as the rest of the city goes, it's there's a lot of different variations of street structures in the city. Um, and so starting with the most important areas where we expect pedestrians to be, such as schools and parks, is somewhere that we wanted to let council know we were going to start um, and that it wasn't really practical to paint curbs, especially in places where they weren't. Um, but we can absolutely come back to council with a overall strategy for the rest of the city. Yeah, I think it's only fair you're posing, I mean, it makes the most sense. You're posing the question to us for just one particular area. I'd like to um, just see what's going on with the rest of the city and with those adjustments so that I'm a resource to the community on those changes and where they took place, as well as just in case one of them should be a bike rack or opposite of a loading zone or nothing at all. I'd like to offer that input. So I'd like for staff to bring that back. I have another question. Not the whole, I'm well, I'm happy with moving this forward as is. Thank you. Do you have a question? Yeah. Sorry. Um, talking about the B cycle, because there is the one um, corral that's at the end of San Jose Ave, just on the opposite side, but I don't think that was ever a parking spot where the B cycle bikes are now at San Jose and Esplanade. I don't believe so, but that would also be restricted of the daylighting law because that's on the approach. Right. It's a one-way street. So, Okay moving them to the other side of the street right because it was already uh it was already painted red to begin with um but either way it that one is selected for bike parking so i'm fine with that i just was curious if that was part of the discussion but the uh, i think the b cycle anyways i won't get into it but thank you <laughs> any other questions okay we'll take this out to public comment Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for your work and the discussion is really fascinating what came up. And I know the village area somewhat because I have a wonderful chiropractor in Capitol and I pass through the village on the way. And is this called daylighting because 
you will be able to see better as a driver without the parked cars on the corner. Thank you. I didn't, I, I suspected that. And then it sounds like you're coming back later with citywide plans, or because you the focus was on the village right now. So I wondered about that. And then it sounds like a good idea what um, the parking pay stations, I don't know how that'll be affected, but I have to tell you, I was in the city council when they voted to take out the perfectly good meters that you put quarters in that were right here in the parking lot and other places. And the pay stations, you have to use cell phones, they're complicated. I don't think it's as good at all. And they discussed problems with them. And I talked to someone who said she actually got a ticket because she parked her car. And by the time she went to the pay station to do all that she had to do to go back, there was a ticket on her car. Anyway, I wish we had the old meters back. I have my quarters. I wish we had pay phones for quarters, too. Anyway, it does sound like a, um, a pretty good plan for safety. It was really interesting what you put up there. And uh, I'll look to see the changes when I drive by. When is this um, anticipated to be implemented? Thank you. Any further public comments? Seeing none, we will bring it back to the council. Do you want to... Um, this is implemented January 1st, is that correct? So it's citable on January 1st. The intent is once we are done with the beach festival that the crew will start implementing the changes in the village. Great. So that's end of September. Beginning of October, this will start. Okay. Comments? Votes? Comment. Um, this is something we have to do, so it, it makes sense that staff has done its, its due diligence and met with folks that it affects. Um, I like the ideas that we have um, to maximize uh, the losses that we have. So we got to do what we got to do. So there we are. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm happy to see both bike parking and, and loading. Um, like the vice mayor said, I, I do think the one in front of the building closest to Zelda's will be beneficial because um, right now, typically the way that loading happens, it happens across the Esplanade. So there's a lot of back and forth. And I think um, it might be a little bit more courteous for those that are driving in the goods for us. Um, but yeah, to utilize those other spaces for bike parking, I think is great. And then I would definitely like to see where else the bike parking could be possible within the city, um, whatever it makes sense. Um, and um, yeah, thanks for, for the presentation. I think it's a good way to do what we got to do. Thank you. Yeah, a few comments. Um, I will start off by saying that um, I did like what Council Member Clark had to say about potentially looking into turning the Esplanade into a pedestrian pathway. I know that would be a significant project, but I've just, you know, I've been in lots of cities around the world that have really nice, like, cobblestone, mixed-use streets that are pedestrian-centric with the ability to drive through, and I think that could be a really good solution for the Esplanade in the long run. Um, and then I'll also say, regarding the use, it sounds like we're pretty sure that it is limited to those two or three categories, but if there are any other possible novel ways to use the space that we're going to be gaining, um, that would be really interesting to look into. I don't know where it could be, you know, benches or chargers or, you know, there could be some other public asset if it is allowed. And I, I think we should look into that. And then finally, I want to state that I would be strongly opposed to having areas um, throughout Capitola that are not marked in any way where citizens will receive citation for parking. I know 
Jamie specifically said, like the corner example, there's a lot of examples that are common sense. I don't feel that this is common sense at all. And I believe that the best way to get across the message is to use paint or signage, even though that will be costly. I know we have finite resources, but I, we can't teach people through citations about the new rules that are coming from the state. So thank you. Yeah, go ahead. No problem. I was just looking at um, slide number nine. It's of uh, Stockton and um, Capitola, and the we're switching the 24-hour loading zone from one side of the street to the other, from Quality Market to David Ling, and then directly Kitty Corner across the intersection that is also marked as 24-hour loading. But I would almost rather see that be bike parking, seeing as how it's right in front of. Um, like a, a shop front. So it's not really a restaurant or anything. I think if we want to, if we know we have bike traffic coming into the village on a heavier basis pretty soon here, then I think um, that spot specifically might be more uh, suitable for bike parking. Yes. Yes, that one. Thank you. <laughs> I'm excited about all the bike. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to hmm, motion. I, go for it. I'm just saying I'm excited about the bike parking. Just for clarity, um, because we're just approving the coastal development permit this evening, but I'm hearing some pretty um, great feedback regarding painting and a change. Do you need that amendment to be included in tonight's motion, or we're just approving the coastal development permit? No. Okay. So I, I just want to add that I'm in agreement with Councilmember Peterson, in terms of the paint, otherwise it makes sense not for that to be a citable thing. That was well said. Mm -hmm. And then similarly for the additional bike rack, um, I'm in agreement with that as well. Um, so I think Councilmember Morgan, you were going to oh, motion. Yes, you've received our comments, so I'll make a movement, uh, <laughs> a motion to approve the coastal development permit for the daylighting law AB four one three. Second. Right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We will go to our final item of the evening, item 8C, about a public art project. I'm excited about this. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'll start us off. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, uh, the item here before you tonight is a Begonia Festival commemorative public art project. Next slide, please. So, the recommended action for this evening is to adopt a resolution that will approve the Begonia commemorative public art project, authorize a city manager to execute a $40,000 um, professional services agreement with artist Jeffrey Nelson and amend the adopted um, FY2425 budget to accept a $20,000 donation from the Capitola Beach Festival and allocate funding for site preparation and installation. Next slide, please. All right, so the Art and Cultural Commission's responsibility is to administer um, the public art fund and in due to the begonia fields closing um, the final begonia festival was held in 2017. Um, shortly after that time the board that put put on the begonia festival um, started the transition process from an, to from in the nonprofit that it was to the what then became the capitola beach festival so this is a very poignant item our upcoming weekend events. Um, that board voted to donate $20,000 to the city um, for a commemorative public art project commemorating the Begonia Festival. And the Art and Cultural Commission was interested in supporting that project. Um, in March of 23, a call to artists was published and the commission received 11 submissions to that. 
uh, a committee was formed to review those submissions, and they um, selected three artists to present the concepts. Then, um, on April 9th, the commission selected the proposed concept by Jeffrey Nelson, who is here in chambers, and he will be presenting um, further details of the project. And I believe there's one more slide. Yeah. So uh, the, propo the proposed concept, as council here, in order for it to be installed in the site, um, a concrete base will need to be installed in the site as well as electrical run to it as the commission had a desire for the proposed concept to have a lighted an illuminated element um, to the sculpture. The size and location of the proposed concept um, requires a building permit. And if this is approved, staff will continue with that process. All right, and then, so I'm gonna turn it over to Jeffrey Nelson who will um, present the proposed concept. Thank you very much. This is nice to be here after all this time. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of background on me and also my partner, Lynn Jay. Um, I, I live and work in Santa Cruz for the past 14 years. I've lived in the tannery, and that's I, I, um, I've been a full-time artist, um, a full-time sculptor for the last 10 years. Um, I have built sculptures uh, public art sculptures for the um, Ebb and Flow Festival that was in um, for the San Lorenzo Valley or San Lorenzo River. Uh, I've did, done a couple of them. Uh, they were the ones that were hanging over the bridge that was the pedestrian walkway uh, near the tannery. Uh, I've also done uh, other sculptures that are public art for Burning Man and that. Um, my partner, Lynn, uh, she is a full-time artist as well. She's a painter, um, and she's lived in Santa Cruz for the last 30 years. Uh, she's done a number of things with Capitola, which is she's done the Capitola Art and Wine poster, and she does, she's does. she been doing the festival, I think, for many, many years as well. Uh, she also was a poster artist for the uh, Monty Foundation. Uh, and this is one of the ones that she designed and that I built, and it it's, has similarities to my proposed concept. Um, this one, this one is, no, hold on just a minute. Um, so the, the proposed concept, it went through a number of iterations. The first one, you can change it. And the 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 uh, committee said it was a flower on a stick, <laughs> which it sort of was, <laughs> but but it was the idea of you know of placing the begonia front and center, and uh, it this one somewhat shows the materials that I'm comfortable working in. What what they are is they're a brushed aluminum. And then they're painted in a transparent um, auto paint. Uh, you want to do the next slide? Now, this one is lit with LEDs. I actually have the piece here, but um, it's lit with LEDs. And uh, so it has a nice glowing element to it. Um, but what I did was then I decided that uh, in consultation with Lynn, because Lynn is better about knowing what, what people are going to be wanting in the, with this group, and I'm, I'm more conceptual. And so the, the next one was what we came up with. So what we came up with was to do three begonias that are, in the, that are very, fairly accurate to how begonias really are. Um, they're going to be, I didn't, we took away the stick, so there's no more begonias on a stick. And uh, it's going to be a, about six feet high. The flowers will be about four feet wide. They're going to be three-dimensional, so they're, they're fairly deep. They also will be accurately painted in a, a very... I, 
I learned more about begonias than I've ever, <laughs> ever needed to know. And I was very helpful with some very nice books on begonias and magazines, so I learned everything about begonias. Um, but uh, so we ended up doing it where um, I wanted to, I wanted to have the the flowers be yeah let's just stop on that one the flowers be uh, you know sort of front center it's in that one spot where most of the traffic is coming up and down the one street but you can also see it as you come down from the Shadow Brook so I wanted so you could see it from all sides um, the 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 leaves are nice in that we added them because they make them a bit more accurate to what the begonias are really like now the base was a bit tricky because if you don't put them on a stick, what do you put them on? So I, I, I was thinking about the idea that, that the Capitola is also a big part of Capitola is the beach. And I started thinking about sandcastles and actually what they just did with the city in Santa Cruz, the um, uh, Denovan, who did the pyramids. And they're just a great classic um, uh, feature. Of, the, of anybody that goes to the beach. But also, they were a great way to sit the, the uh, begonias up. I thought they could be in pots, but that would be a little too literal. And then I started thinking about, well, what should the base be like and how should it be? And also, the, another big factor about the begonia festival is it takes place on the water. And so I wanted to do something that sort of symbolized that idea of the, of the lagoon and that and how it then all the you know floats are actually on the water and then you have the sky so i decided that it would be interesting and the committee liked the idea that it would go it would go from a deep blue of, of like the, of the sea up to a light blue that would be the sky um, and then at a point this is how it's going to be made it has a steel structure um, and then the the, the, and the actual, the stems go down and, and are bolted into the concrete platform. There's the electricity that goes up through the, through the uh, flowers. Now, the lighting is interesting because LEDs are tricky. The original one I had would be very, fairly tricky to um, replace. So I had a great consultation with Roy, who obviously runs a lighting company and is part of the committee. And we talked about using bulbs, something simple that can be replaced easily. And there are these LED bulbs, and they can just be literally screwed in. And they are color changing. So it's a fairly simple, the way you would actually replace the bulb is you just have to take out four, you just unscrew four nuts, take it out, put it in, screw it back in. They have about, the bulbs have a, in, with being run six hours a day, they have about a 11 year life for each bulb, and they only cost about, about ten dollars each, so they're not that expensive. They would also be run on a, like a photo a photo timer, photo sensitive or light sensitive timer. They could they go on and off for about. Because also, I think that the thing is that you know, obviously, Capitola is a place where a lot of uh, tourists come down, but also we come down quite often to go to bands at night and stuff. And it's nice to have a a feature, a sculpture that's that's lit at night when 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 the locals are hanging out, and so I think you know at first because they were there was some concern about the LEDs and how you know how they're going to work, and so I thought oh well I'll just take them out and I'll just light it from the outside, but I I think this is a much more elegant way and it does it it will enhance the way the light glows from inside. It also addresses anything about any direct lights going into people's eyes as they're driving and that, because all the lighting is inside and it's, it's not, there's no point source of light. It just glows from the inside. Um, and, and so, and that's about what it'd be like. That's the spot it'd be. And that's, um, it's not, it's not because I Photoshopped it, obviously. <laughs> It's not turned the right way. It's actually the yellow flower would be turned more towards the, towards the uh, traffic. But that's it. Thank you. Um, oh, still on. Okay. So the proposed location for um, this um, commemorative art project is on the corner of Wharf Road and Cliff Drive near Stockton Bridge. There's a landscape area on that corner, um, and 
Um, with the help of Director Khan, we have outlined how we would establish the concrete pad and run the electrical to that specific site um, for the pro proposed concept to be installed. Next slide, please. And then, so as an image of, of the landscape areas. Um, so it is right there on that corner. Um, it will be set back in order to ensure visibility for um, any traffic that is there on the corner as well. Next slide, please. Um, so the the budget for um, the budget amendment for this item is to is a twofold to accept the beach festivals donation, um, which is twenty thousand dollars. And so, in addition to the planned um, artist contract that was included in the call to artist. Um, those two totaling for $40,000 for the artist contract and then to incorporate the site preparation expenses into the budget as well, um, which is the establishment of the concrete pad and the running of the electrical to the site so that the, site, so the project can be eliminated um, for a total of $58,000 um, for this planned project. And so again, the recommended action is to approve the Begonia Commemorative Public Art Project, um, authorize the city manager to execute a $40,000 professional services agreement with the artist Jeffrey Nelson, and amend the adopted budget of FY2425 um, to accept a $20,000 donation from the Capitola Beach Festival, formerly Capitola Begonia Festival, um, and allocate funding for the site in preparation and installment. And with that, I myself and Jeffrey are available for questions. Thank you. Questions? Um, how late into the evening will the will it be illuminated? Or is that dependent on the time of year? Um, so I, I believe the intent is, is that it would be illuminated, um, but uh, I, I think Jeffrey could probably answer a little bit more there that I do think it's possible to put it on a timer. And then we've also previously discussed the ability to dim so that we can make sure that we hit the right illumination. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, what I would, I mean, obviously my suggestion is told about 11 o'clock at night because that's when most of the bands end and people are, I mean, maybe even 10, 1030 because the bands, the bars and, you know, it's sort of quiet after 1030. Mm -hmm. So that it, I don't think it should be done any later than that. Yeah. I just, have we reached out to the residents that are across the street? So, um, a postcard notifying, um, a large part of the community, particularly in that area, was sent out in preparation of this council meeting so that anybody um, would be aware that we were discussing this item um, at tonight's agenda. The postcard that went out included um, the language that it would be an illuminated sculpture, um, the location of the, the actual map that you saw here in the presentation, and a, the drawing that you saw in the presentation as the concept image. Yeah, I think it's great. I just don't want us to get into a position we did with the lights on Monterey that ended up being too bright for everybody, and then there there was backlash. So I don't want to get to that point. So, yeah, so, <laughs> but it sounds great. <laughs> oh, no, it's a good point, but this is really not anything that's going to be like in in it because how it is is that the, if you can think of a hole with a bulb, and then there's a uh, a piece of metal, of aluminum that stops it. So it's actually just lighting up the metal. Yeah. Okay. So it's actually there's no direct light. In fact, I, my my concern is that it might be too dim. So okay. Okay. Thank you. Those are my questions. I had a quick question um, regarding the lighting. Is the effect going to be similar to the image of the flower on a pole that we see lit up? Or is it going to be significantly different lighting than that? It, it will be it, the one that had the LEDs had more light coming out on the side. This will be because there's a single bulb. Before the LEDs, there were about you know like six feet of LEDs. And again, in consultation with Roy, we sort of he had some great suggestions. So it will be less bright than on the on the on so the just slide. A single bulb per flower. Yeah, there I'm working on actually because 
LED, these RGB LED bulbs are very dim. That's one problem with them. Um, is there like 85 watts? Is there, which is a fairly dim bulb. Um, what I'm looking at is whether one or two bulbs in each one that would, so again. Because yeah, it almost looks like with the LED one that you have lighting in between each like level of the flower petals. Is that correct? You do. Yeah. In that one you do because it was, it was also the LEDs were moving um, because they were, they're, they're, they're on the, on a, on a line that, you know, you can change all the colors. Um, in this case, the, the color just is a single color that just keeps changing its color. It rotates to all of its colors. And if I do have two bulbs, then it's sort of nice because then you have two different colors that could be happening. I, that's just the physical way of building how, how much space I have within that to put one or two bulbs in. Thank you. Mr. Nelson, don't go anywhere. Um, my question is, um, how easy is this to move? We are hoping at some point we can retrofit our beautiful Stockton Bridge. Um, is this some, a piece that you're building so that it could be moved easily if we need to get a giant crane out there during a storm or something like that? No, no, it's quite easy to move because it has a, uh, it's, at one point I was thinking of doing it in, in concrete, then it'd be very hard to move. And, but what I've decided, because I like keeping the aluminum of the flower and then the way that the base is going to be. So the base is not very heavy, and it can be unbolted and taken away very easily. Right. I, I wasn't sure if you were made aware of some things. That yeah, no, no. It, okay. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it, it's not because it's not going to be a solid concrete base any longer. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It actually raises another question for me. Um, if we do have to move it at some point, is it going to cost $20,000? Just the approximate cost of the installation, if I'm right? So the, um, the cost of developing the concrete pad to hold the structure and running the electrical is the $18,000. And then there's the $40,000, which is the artist contract for the work for the public art um, project. So if we needed to move the actual art piece, the concrete pad, which is only gonna be like a four inch high, four by four concrete pad um, would, stay in the same place um, if we were like moving large equipment around it, if we did end up needing to move the entire concrete pad and relocate the sculpture, I would want to look to Director Khan as to um, if that would be the same cost, but I would assume so if we needed to relocate the foundation that the sculpture is going to go on. Yeah. Because the, the piece itself is, is easy to move. Yeah, the piece can be... If we needed to move the foundation as well. Yeah, I mean, and obviously the the piece is just going to be concrete bolted in, or it's going to be bolted into the concrete. So it, it's it's movable quite easily. I mean, I'm going to be doing it when I, when I do that. And so... I wonder if there's a way to make the concrete pad more movable during the construction, just in case we needed to move the whole thing. Is there any way to do that to make it... I think the nature of pouring concrete is, is, is especially at the scale that we're talking about. Just it's lifted up. No. <laughs> like hammer it away. And it, no. and it would have electrical in the concrete foundation. Like pour it into it. Yeah. I would assume. I, I don't know the details. Well, that's another thing. If we think we, there's a possibility of having to move it, I wonder if there's a way to engineer the pad so it's like a disconnect. I think or... moving it would be a temporary thing, right? And then we would move it back. So like the, the sculpture itself, we would move back. Right. What what circumstance are you thinking of that we would need right. to move an I'm entire? Thinking if there's pad. major renovations so, or changes to Stockton Bridge. My that my question back. was, <clears throat> excuse me. My question was whether we could move it. Um, we had a large crane that had to go on, and so if that space, if the crane needed to come back, it was we, he shared that you can pick up the art and move it. The second example I used was. Um, um, now I forgot my other example. The concrete pad, the, could yeah. the crane pull over It would be fine. Pull over it a concrete pad? completely fine needed. that it can move, yes. It's significantly 
away from the river or the creek anyways. Yeah, so that's so that's it won't affect it. Because there could be significant work on the bridge in the next decade. Yeah, I think that if we're going to be talking about reconfiguring that intersection, talking about the bridge, those sorts of projects, those you know, those projects are millions of dollars. Um, and so if in the course... Yeah, if in the course of it we needed to find a new spot for this somewhere, I think that that could be worked into that project budget. Okay. Um, the uh, so can you go back to the recommendation, the slide with the recommendation on it? Did you want to take public comment? I have a question. Oh. about the what's on the slide for the recommendation, and then I'll go to public comment. So it says we're authorizing the $40,000 professional services agreement, and that's the $20,000 donation and the $20,000 from the art fund. But then it says allocate funding for site preparation and installation. So that's that $18,000. Where's that coming from? Is that general fund? Also the public art fund. Oh, it's also the public. So none of yeah. this is coming from general fund. This is There's no new budget. Awesome. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll bring this now to public comment. Um, I, I like what it looks like, and as someone who's electrosensitive, I have this hat in here because the lights bother me and the LED lights bother me. I wish we had the incandescent. Is it, is, is there, a, and it, there's so much electrical pollution, I recommend a book called the Invisible Rainbow, a history of electricity and life by Arthur Furstenberg. And it shows each time there's an increase in electro pollution, there's increased illnesses like flus that wasn't there before electricity came in and increased mortality rate. I just feel over... Uh, I turn off the circuit breakers in my house at night. If I have to get up, I have a flashlight by the bed. I'm not the only one. So I'm just wondering, is the electricity necessary with the LED lights? Is it very soft or is it just as viable and beautiful without the electricity? That's, that's just a thought I have. But I like the way it looks. Thank you. Artists are amazing. I don't have that talent, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. you want me to answer? I know we're going to finish public comment first, and then we'll come, we'll come back to um, responses. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Uh, my name is Lori Hill. And um, I'm delighted that Jeffrey and Lynn Jay are here uh, to present this project. It's uh, been a long time in the works. Um, sentimentally, uh, this is representing 65 years of the Capitola Begonia Festival. And uh, using the begonias as the image to commemorate the Begonia Festival is so very appropriate because this all started with a bunch of begonia gardens up in the area of 41st Avenue. And uh, we became literally entitled um, the begonia capital of the world. Uh, and then somebody had this wild idea to take begonia blossoms and put them on a floating barge. The festival began. There were... I mean, just ask any of our local historians about what the Begonia Festival represented to this community and the hundreds of volunteers over 65 years that put on this festival for Capitola. I, looking over at your city manager, I have, to, I have to tell a little story in that I was the president that ended the Begonia Festival, um, had no choice, 
And I, I went to the city manager and I said, well, you know, we're, we're not going to have any more begonia festivals. And his first remark to me was, you, you can't end the begonia festival. <laughs> That's how important it was to the community as a whole. So um, the last begonia festival was in 2017. It was a very cheerful but triumphant festival. Uh, we made it a gala celebration and uh, went out with a bang. Uh, Jeffrey and Lynn Jay's work celebrates the flower at the heart of the festival. Um, I was one of the ones that proposed the commemorative art to begin with, and I led the sub, uh, subcommittee with um, our, our chair over there, Roy Johnson, and Mary Beth Cahalan to come to this concept before you. I am delighted that, that you're looking at it, and and frankly, I think the lighting is very important to this piece because color is very important to the begonia flower. And I appreciate the artist being patient with me because I was the one complaining about the stick and also the one bringing several different renderings of what a begonia really looks like. And he just said, yeah, yeah, I get it. And that's what we have before us today. Thank you. I'm Mary Beth Cahalan, and I'm an arts commissioner, also president of the Beach Festival. That's this weekend. Um, this piece has a lot of meaning for everybody in this community. It is the city flower. All our street signs have the begonia on it, and I love the mood lighting. <laughs> you can do a lot of fun things with that. I can see a lot of Photoshop ops for everybody, and I think this is a great piece. I think the artist did a great job. We really ran him through the ringer, I will be honest with you. I was one of the ones totally against the popsicle stick, and he changed all that. So I have to say we have worked really well with him, and I think he's an amazing artist, and I think this piece really needs to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Uh, Roy Johnson from the Arts Commission. Um, this has been a real history. Now, a lot of you maybe are too young, maybe never hardly ever went to the um, festival, but um, it was such a solid thing. And I think that um, the uh, Beach Festival is stepping up and donating money. The Arts Commission has this. Uh, our little fund that we are dedicated to public art. And I think it would be appropriate when we're talking about the $18,000, which is a little bit more than we anticipated, that it would be great if the city stepped up and donated as much as you can uh, afford toward that $18,000 so that we don't have to take it off the public art fund for future projects. So um, you were surprised when uh, you discovered that we were paying for that. Well, maybe you can uh, backtrack that a little bit and talk amongst yourself and see if you can uh, try to help out on the $18,000. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comment on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back uh, for discussion. I'd like to thank everybody in the Arts and Cultural Commission. I, I'm on it also. I've, I've seen all the work and dedication that everybody put into this. So um, it's a no-brainer. It's, it's going to be a great project for the city. I'm looking forward to it, uh, driving down the road at night and, and seeing that beautiful sculpture. Comments? I have a couple comments. Yeah, I just want to... Um the Arts and Cultural Commission for putting in the legwork behind this. And I just want to mention that um, when I first saw the um, presentation of the proposed art piece, I thought to myself, well, I wish that I could see like a, you know, realistic 3D rendering of this to really know what it's going to look like. But um, having seen the other art by Jeffrey Nelson here and visiting your website, I just want to say how impressed I am with your portfolio. And I think you guys really found the right person for this job. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. 
My comment is, Roy, you can tell me I'm young any day of the week if, if I didn't get to enjoy all those Begonia festivals, because I did, and they're amazing. Um, and even my little one got to enjoy a few before we had to retire the beautiful festival. Um, Mr. Nelson, the work is incredible. I'm so happy that we're, we have consensus with the, the, um, the commissioners today and to hear them supporting this project. It's great. Um, I'm happy to hear that it is funded as is this, this evening. Um, and if I may make a motion um, to, and I'm just gonna go with the recommended action as proposed this evening, to adopt a resolution approving the Begonia Commemorative Public Art Project, authorizing the city manager to execute a professional services agreement with Mr. Nelson in the amount of 40,000 for the project and amending the 24-25 budget to accept a $20,000 donation from the Capitola Beach Festival and allocate funding for preparation of the project site for installation. I'll second. And then uh, I would also like to thank the Art and Cultural Commission um, Mr. Nelson, this is beautiful work. I'm, I appreciate the time that you took to ensure that it was um, florally accurate. And, uh, you know, I think we all have um, a lot of memories of the Begonia Festival, and uh, it means something special to all of us. My grandma on my dad's side was one of the Begonia Festival princesses in the late 50s, one of the first, first few Begonia Festivals. And I remember in the 90s when, was it the Lion King float that was too big and it ran into the bridge and like <laughs> fell over? So, yeah. <laughs> Always lots of good memories there is what I'm saying. So I'm excited to see that there's going to be a kind of commemoration through public art of, of this part of Capitola history. And I really like that it's going to glow. I know in, um, you know, it's an art piece of a much bigger scale that wouldn't be appropriate for Capitola, but in Pismo Beach, they have this huge thing that says Pismo Beach and it glows, and there's something just kind of magical about the glow of it at night, and people are always trying to take pictures with it. So I think this is going to be a really just kind of magical addition to, to Capitola Village. So thank you. Um, any other comments? Okay, with that, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much. All right, with that, we bring us to the end of our meeting. Our, reg our next regularly scheduled city council meeting is on October 10th at 6 p.m. See you then. Until then, our meeting's adjourned. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Good night.